We moved around a lot, but we ended up in Oscoda, if any of you know where that's at, up on the Osaba River on uh, the Lake Huron side. And it's a beautiful area up there. My sister was living in a place uh, that she was renting up there, and she had decided to move out. And so uh, in her decision to move out, my dad and my brother were helping her move. I had to work that day. I came home from work, and my mom was shouting frantically, your brother and your dad, I guess I still feel emotional, this has been many years, uh, your brother and your dad have been beat up and they're in the hospital. And I carried a lot of anger for a long time. Not just with that, but just in general, I felt there was something that I had this edge and this anger about that I was carrying around. But I was livid when I heard this and, and of course had a lot of explicatives, we're gonna go kick their butts and you know, and I went up to see my, my dad and my brother in the hospital and uh, it, it was just, it was just so shocking that it had happened. And so what had taken place at the house was my sister was uh, taking all of her stuff out of the house and um, the landlord uh, had a couple of his friends up from Saginaw, Flint or Saginaw, I don't remember, um, that were with him that weekend and they were watching everything she was taking out. But everything in the house was actually hers and so my sister was feeling frustrated as she was feeling like uh, they were being hawkish with everything. And she said, why don't you just take a picture, you know? And so in her frustration, obviously it was projected onto them as well. And um, one of the guys said, what'd you say? Uh, just shut up or shut the hell up, something like that. And that's when my dad stepped in. Now my dad's about, he was about five, five, six at the most. And uh, he was not a big guy, and the guy he was speaking to was about 6'2". But, you know, it was his daughter, and he was going to stand firm and protect her. And so, in any case, uh, next thing you know, a fight ensued, and uh, my brother got some, oh, well, let's see, my dad got stitches in his head, and my brother uh, had his eyes swollen shut. And uh, so, it was some time after that that my sister, I had seen, that she was throwing away the key to the apartment where she was staying at, and I was watching her throw that away. And when she left, I went and got the key out of there because I was not done with them. I was not done with, with them and what I was thinking were possibly going to do with them from severe pain or possibly killing them. It was so outrageous to me, I couldn't think of anything else. And so along my journeys of, you know, diving deeper into who I am, I begin to see that, you know, why would I carry this poison around expecting something is going to happen to them? And so it took me many, many years, maybe 10, 12 years after that, maybe more, I don't even remember to be honest with you, but it took me a lot of years to decide to throw that key out. And of course, that was the beginning of the healing process. And I want to I share, sidetracking, and then I'll come back to the story. I was working, I uh, used to do energy healing work, and I was working with my aunt. And my aunt had um, been with a gentleman for a long time that they had a wonderful relationship with. And she was just angry with him. And she was starting to find yourself wanting to know more about God. So I was doing energy healing work with her. I was doing counseling work with her. And I said, would you be willing to forgive Eddie? I will never forgive him, you know? And I was trying to dive in just a little deeper as to what, what she was holding on to. And so we began to talk about forgiving herself. And, you know, we're, we're, we're blessed to have a life and a God that creates this beautiful mirror reflection of who we are everywhere around us. God is showing us who we are and who we are not. But it's always reflecting back to us in some way things that we are holding on to. And so I begin to help her to forgive herself. And then maybe a few months after I, was, I would see her, I think once a week, and maybe a few months into it, I said, 
can I ask you, you know, about Eddie again? I said, would you be willing to forgive him 20 years from now? And she said, yeah, I can do that 20 years from now. And the, the point is with it, I know it seems so silly, right? It's so far down the road, but the beautiful part of it is when she said yes, she cracked the door open for possibilities. And, and so that's sometimes all we need is just to make one tiny gesture to show God, and Father, I don't want to hold on to this anymore. I don't want to drink this poison. So coming back to the story of my family and taking so many years to throw that key away, I realized that that was just the beginning. Actually, I don't know, know if I realized it in that moment, but certainly later on in my years, I realized it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough just to forgive them. What we have to do eventually, we don't have to, but I find it works a lot better to, and that is to say, do I wish them well? It's a different level because we might say, oh, okay, I can forgive them. You know, and it might be, yeah, I forgive them. Maybe it's just out of duty or obligation. But true forgiveness is when we chime in to say, I truly wish them well. I want the best for them because if you're wanting the best for them, whatever they are reflecting back to you, you're getting that. You're getting that because whatever they're reflecting back to you, the anger, the frustration, the, um, the arrogance, whatever it is, by forgiving them, you are forgiving that aspect of yourself. And so that's why it's so beautiful to practice forgiveness with other people because we end up getting it back for ourselves. But for me, it took me a long time to say, I said, okay, I can forgive them. I've thrown the key away. I'm not ready to wish them well. And that took a lot more years. But if I'm being honest, they're not the highest on my priority list as far as wishing them well. I'm just being honest with you. And you know what? It's okay. It's okay. because The reason it's okay is because I know me and there will be a time where I will let it go. And the truth is, it's not even me really holding on to it. It's this ego self, this idea of who I think I am, what I refer to as the person. This personal idea of who I think I am. But my soul, my, my essence of who I am, doesn't hold on to anything. It doesn't need them or me or anyone else to be any different than they are or that I am, that I'm clear on. So, but we are given these teachings to experience our person, this personal idea of who we think we are as a way of bringing to the surface those things that are standing in the way of our awakening to who we are. And to me, there's no greater thing that we can do is to awaken to who we are because that is the ultimate forgiveness. Um, I, I can't remember what it was uh, a couple months ago that I was supposed to speak here, Mary? A month? A month? Only, I, I can't keep track of time anymore. So in any case, that morning, uh, well, I'll back up just a little bit. So about maybe a week, four or five days before my talk, um, I wasn't having a lot of speaking going on or teaching my classes and I'm like, and now I'm semi-retired. I took Social Security, so I'm like, I'm bored. I want something to do, you know? And I thought, I'm not gonna turn on the TV. I'm, I'm not gonna look to something just to distract me. You know, I'm gonna be present and mindful with my thoughts that say I'm bored, which is not my essence that's bored. It's my personal idea that says life has to look this way in order to be entertaining or fun or whatever it is. So I was, deciding very clearly I'm going to be very aware of my thoughts and I'm not going to avoid them. And I started uh, doing a lot of meditation. I started watching my teachers online and I was really diving deep into spirituality. And I came to this place, um, again, maybe, I don't know, five days or so into it where I'm like, I was just 
I was there. I was just at peace. I was this witness to this person, to this body, to this mind, to all this person's problems. I didn't... It didn't matter what my personal life was because I knew I was a witness to all of those issues and challenges. And that's the ultimate forgiveness, right? It's the ultimate forgiveness because when you step into the truth of who you are, there's nothing to forgive. There's nothing to forgive because you see that you are peace, you are joy, you are love, you are truth, you are one with God in that moment. And when you are that, you don't need anything or anyone to be any different than what they are. So that's why I say there's no greater that we've been given. That's why we're here, is to awaken to that truth. And I don't recall if I've say, said this before, but I'll say it anyhow. And that is a, awakening is when the awareness and the mind or the personal idea of who you think you are separate. That you're clear that you're not this body, this, this mind, you're not your thoughts, you're not all your ideas or opinions. You're simply the awareness and the witness to them. And you could like, if you had an out-of-body experience, there is this invisible force standing in front of you. It's like, oh, okay. I see Brett's really frustrated with this. Okay. I see Brett is trying to figure out how to be happy in life. I see Brett's trying to figure out a way to get more money. I see Brett wants to heal his relationship here. You are the witness to all of that. You are the witness to all this personal idea of who you think you are. And that, there can be no greater forgiveness than that. Um, I sometimes, I've spoken on forgiveness in the past at different places. And one of the talks, uh, the titles that I've used was, instead of the power of forgiveness was walking with a forgiving heart. And the one thing I'm just crystal clear on is we have to carry this vibration, this attitude of forgiveness wherever we go because life is always providing us opportunities to let go of judgment, of blame, or any of that. And by carrying around this attitude of forgiveness, it allows us to be present for all things going on in life. And so I find that the, just the more I practice forgiveness, the easier it gets. It just continues to get easier and easier. Um, I remember listening to Eckhart Tolle online one time and somebody said, when's the last time that you had judgment? And he said, well, last week. You know, so it's like, you think he's this master teacher, and he is, but it's like, yeah, he, he, they all have their stuff and any master will acknowledge you know, we, the only way you can be here on earth is if you have an ego, you know. So, so he started describing how this guy was kind of dawdling in front of him at the grocery store and on his phone, not paying attention. And, um, and then he runs off to, because he forgot something, he runs off in line. Eckhart's noticing how he really has a lot of judgment about this person. And then this person comes back and, and uh, looks over at Eckhart and says, yeah, sorry I took so long. He goes... Oh, Eckhart Tolle, I've always wanted to meet you. And so it was just really this funny moment of here this guy was actually practicing some of these things. But look, we, we, we all do things. We all do things that we're, we either we weren't proud of or we're not proud of. But God is not asking us to carry the burden and the weight forward. It really isn't. And I, and I love one of the teachings... Um, I don't always teach on the Bible, but I, th I think I shared something in the Bible last time. But this, the, the story of the, a lot of people refer to it as the prodigal son, but it's called the lost son. And it's about how the two boys are going to inherit their father's wealth. And one of them approaches the father beforehand and says, I want mine now. I want to go out and explore the world. I don't want to wait until later. And his father says, gladly, I'll give it to you. And so he goes out, and I'm just um, doing it in my own uh, lingo here and, and my abridged version of it. He goes out, he parties, and he squanders all of his money. And then he finds himself ending up working 
I believe in the fields, where he's working in the fields for just to survive because he's squandered all his money. He has nothing left. And in that moment, he said, I'm no different than one of my father's servants at home. And so he really realized in that moment, with his head down and with humility, he came back. And he came back to his father, and his father was elated to see him there. He said, you know, kill the fatted calf. We're going to celebrate the return of my son. My son has returned home. And, of course, we don't know if this is a true story or a, just a metaphor that Jesus is using because Jesus tells the story. But the story is how we're invited to go out into the world Make mistakes, explore, squander your money, do what you need to do, and then when you're ready, come back home. Come back home to the Father, come back home to God, come back home to yourself, whatever that is. But part of it is we were always meant to make mistakes, always. We were always meant to make mistakes. And in fact, if you look a little deeper, you could say that we're, we, we believe we're each in control of our minds, our thoughts, our decisions. But I invite you to look a little closer because are you the one that's saying, I'm not enough? Are you the one saying they're not enough? Are you the one that's saying, I need the world to be this way or that way? Are you the one that is judging all of this? Or is it the mind and the conditioning of the mind that has convinced you as to who you are and is simply acting out of that conditioning? Because I would say, we're not the ones making the choices. There's something else making the choices for us. A lot of teachers call it consciousness flowing through us. We are simply the witness to those choices. We are the witness to those experiences. And the more you connect with that, the more you can just sit and be a compassionate witness to say, wow, I see Brett's really got a lot of judgment right now. I see Brett feels shame or guilt from this experience. But what I love more and more as I just connect with my true beingness, I'm able to just notice those thoughts and know that they are not who I am. And they just simply fall away very quickly. It's only when we, we hook into them that it's, we believe it's the truth, that's when they drag us through the mud of life. But if you can simply be a witness to those thoughts rather than being pulled into the drama of them, all of life gets easier. Well, we're going to do a meditation, so I, I feel like I want to leave it there and we'll have an opportunity maybe to practice some forgiveness during the meditation. So thank you so much. Or do I just...